another one of my lessons is if you want it bad enough, you're going to make it happen however way it looks. And I feel like most people look for a straight line from here to whatever your goal is. And 90% of the time it's this way, just noodles. I wanted to help the little Michelles who are deaf and hard of hearing. I really want them to know that they can achieve anything. Welcome to the Hearing Wellness Journey Podcast, an exploration of determination, hope, self-discovery, and triumph. We'll share the personal experiences of those that are living with hearing loss and provide a haven for their stories to show others that they are not alone in this journey. Please welcome your hosts, Dr. Dawn Hyman and Lindsay Doherty. Welcome everybody to today's podcast episode of the Hearing Wellness Journey. I'm here with Dr. Michelle Hu, and I want her to introduce herself a little bit in case you have not read about her or heard her on another podcast. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm Michelle Hu. I am, I've been a pediatric audiologist for over 12 years in San Diego, California. I grew up with hearing loss. I call it hearing loss because I wasn't diagnosed until I was about three or four years old. I was fit with hearing aids soon after that and received cochlear implants when my first one during graduate school for audiology. I still practice now in the clinic and I've also opened my own community slash business with my online program for parents of children who are deaf and hard of hearing. And here my here I am today. <laughs> I love that. Was your hearing loss, did it inspire you to become an audiologist? It was. I was born with something called enlarged vestibular aqueduct syndrome or EVAS, as well as Pendred syndrome. So it's a recessive gene syndrome where both my parents were carriers and I was that one in four chance of the children getting it. So for me, every time I bumped my head, my hearing would drop and it progressed to about severe to profound hearing loss in both ears by the time I was around age 10. I didn't know this, but I was a cochlear implant candidate back then. I was evaluated and my parents just weren't ready. The technology they felt wasn't there yet. And they also, I was doing very well in school. They didn't know how hard I was paddling underneath that water just to appear like a calm, cool and collected duck paddling across the water is my analogy. And I was learning about CIs in graduate school. I went home to my dad and said, hey, did you guys know this is an option? Did you know that there's this technology that exists for hearing levels such as mine? And my dad goes, uh-huh, yeah. We did know, and interesting that you're learning about it. Tell us more. I decided to get evaluated. I'm a, I was a textbook candidate, and my dad said, if you want to do it, go ahead. You're under our insurance for a couple more years. I implanted my left or worse ear. For me, I felt like I have nothing to lose there, and it was great. My, my preceptor activated my CI. My ENT that I had pretty much grown up with my entire life was the one there I was actually a student and observing under him either the semester before or after I got my CI and it was surreal like I I was on both sides of patient and clinic so I knew the protocols and what we were going to do but I in my head I, I was thinking about all of those things but then telling myself Michelle be a patient just be a patient get to be a patient because you might overanalyze something or you might worry about something. Don't jump too far ahead. Just stay right here, right now. Just stay present with what your audiologist is going to figure out. You're not the audiologist here. You're not the student audiologist. You're the patient you get to receive. So that was the challenge for me. Change and being the patient, sitting back in my chair and letting somebody else assess and analyze and figure out what to do. That had to take a crazy amount of willpower because I'm, I even know right now where I'm sitting here and my kids are telling me symptoms or something, and I'm trying to diagnose them with something <laughs> or a family member. It's super easy. Like, it's as an hard. audiologist, we want to figure out what's going on. We want to fix and come up with solutions. Yes. Um, and the but- best doctors always say, don't Google this. But when you're reading it and you're absorbing that information, that had to be just 
Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, I had at one point, maybe a couple of months later, my preceptor was like, hey, I lip read him and he was like, hey, Renee, turn the screen so Michelle can't see. Cause I, so I was off and I'm like, oh no, but hang on. Like I just trusted the process and I had been complaining about metal mouth. It literally felt like I was chewing aluminum foil or tin foil. What is it? Aluminum foil. Same. And we had to turn a couple of electrodes off. Oh. Now me being me, I was like, no, I want all of them on. But when he did turn them off, it was great. I was like, got it. And now I know we can reallocate to different frequencies on the CI electrode. It can be more comfortable. Turning a couple off does not take away not much of anything of what I'm receiving sound through the electrode, what sounds I'm receiving through the electrode. So I just needed to sit back and just breathe and take it in and trust that the people on the other side of the desk, even though I've been in those shoes, will take care of me. So trusting in my clinician, trusting I will be taken care of it because I know my intentions as an audiologist, I want to take care of them. Don't leave, don't go out that door unless you're happy. Don't go out that door if the sound hurts. Don't go out that door if your hearing aid physically hurts or if you're unclear on the results or explanations of the results of the, whatever test we did. I want to be able to hear, I want to be here to take care of you. And this kind of it goes back to why I created my program is all of the information in there is out there. I just bundled it up into an easier to digest package. It's for parents of children of all different ages. It takes you from diagnosis all the way up through high school. So we talk about IEPs and self-advocacy and building advocacy within your children. And most importantly though, it's not about my journey. It's yours. This is your and your family's journey. However you want it to look like, you do not have to do it the way I did, or you cannot do it the way I did. You don't have my parents. You don't have the exact same environment that I did. And I talk about sign language. I talk about verbal spoken languages. I talk about all of the different professionals that are good to have in your village, on your team. And I also talk about find an audiologist, find a pediatric audiologist. If you have a child who's deaf and hard of hearing that you feel comfortable with that you feel comfortable divulging everything, all of the information so that we can best help you. So you can't get the best care if you don't feel comfortable being vulnerable with your clinician, with your doctor. It just works in all, everywhere in health, in the healthcare. If you don't feel comfortable enough to tell them the whole truth and anything that like maybe they're asking certain questions and you're thinking, how is this related? That's why they went to school. That's why they're practicing so that they can look at the big picture for you with a fresh set of eyes and be able to help you get to where you, you want to get to. And I love that about my team, like my ENT is whichever way you choose, I'm here to support you. And I will, I have the resources, or if I don't know, I'll find those resources for you. It's that relationship that especially in audiology, it's going to be a long-term relationship. You want to cultivate, you want to have nothing, no barriers for communication and feeling safe with that person that I just really value. And I think is so important that for parents that are starting on the journey or along the journey need to realize and learn and pick and choose dating. You get to pick and choose who you get to work with or who works with your children. Yes. Now, just really quick, did you ever have to go through that? And I know you started out as a pediatric case. Did you ever evolve into different, um, different audiologists or ENTs as you went on and your needs changed, your wants changed, maybe they retired or have you been consistent? I'm pretty lucky. So my mom took me to somebody in Akron, Ohio, and he gave me my first pair of hearing aids. Then my mom found Carol Flexer. So she was my pediatric audiologist through college whenever she retired, basically. And she's still a close family friend. Like she's still, she was at my baby shower and she, my mom and her still chat and text. So I got lucky. So my pediatric audiologist was consistent. I did get my hearing aids somewhere else because my dad worked at a university so there was a discount but so their continuity of care wasn't as strong there I don't think it would have been me it would have been is my mom comfortable with that person 
and she was very comfortable with who she found. I don't know if she bounced around a little bit, but yeah, she, all, the, all the phone calls on the back end. Yeah. I, everybody that I knew, whoever did my ear molds or hearing aids or programming was consistent. Dr. Flexer didn't do CI. So once I got my cochlear implant, I was at Cleveland Clinic in Ohio and here. Actually, I got my second cochlear implant here at the children's hospital that I work at because I asked my colleague, my ENT, I was like, hey, I just moved here. I don't know the other ENTs. I know you and I trust you and I love you. Could you do my cochlear implant? Is it possible? And she said she just had to ask the head of the department or something. And uh, yeah, I was the biggest kid in the waiting room that day. (laughs) (laughs) But I love my journey and I wouldn't change it either way. People ask me, why'd you wait three years in between both CIs? When I'm an audiologist recommending, if appropriate, two CIs are typically better than one in, in many scenarios. And I think it goes back to clinicians don't take care of themselves as much as they do their patients. Moms don't take care of themselves as much as as well as they do their children. Yeah, it was a student had a cancellation and I said, why don't you test me? Get comfortable with the buttons on the audiometer, get comfortable with setting up speech perception testing and we're doing a test on me. I'm like, huh, I'm hearing all of these things in my right ear. And I realized my left CI was still on. Oh, okay. Let's take it off. Check out (laughs) the right side. And for me, it was a aha moment because before my CI, I had depended on my right hearing and my right ear and hearing aid for my most of my life. It was my stronger ear. It was my best friend. And I realized, oh my gosh, I hear a lot better on my left side with the CI. I think, I don't want to say it out loud, but I think I should get a right CI. Like I know that I would benefit from it. What a wake up call for sure. Just seeing the two differences and, but it was great being bimodal um, because I was getting the load with my hearing aid for music. Uh, But I eventually did that right CI and it was like surround sound, both sides, just that much more color in the picture. And it was a good decision. I'm glad I waited because I needed to be ready. So when I talk with pediatrics, especially maybe ages 10 and up, and we're talking about a cochlear implant or a hearing aid, or maybe a second cochlear implant, I really try to honor the child or the patient because the patient is my patient, not the parents, no matter Mm -hmm. how much of pediatrics is conversing with parents they get to a certain age where they get to have a say. Parents can force a surgery or force a device on them. But at the end of the day, they could sneak it into the trash. They could sneak it into a drawer. If they're not on board and they're not feeling honored, what's the point? You can lead a horse to water, but he might not drink. Exactly. I was so excited when my grandma started needing the TV louder, needed people to shout at her, needed clarification, all of that. I was like, okay, great. I had been practicing for a few years. I have recommendations for you. I'll tell you what's going to happen at the appointment. I'll tell you what they're going to ask you. I'll tell you what it feels like to get an ear mold made. I was excited to share these audiological types of things that were going to happen to her within my family. And she got her hearing aids. I even paid for them. I'm so excited for you. She never wore them. She never wore them. They're in my drawer. She passed away a few years ago, but they're in my drawer just to remind me, you can lead a horse to water and she may not wear them. I was forcing them on her. And she looked at me and she goes, like, Michelle, I don't want them. Hearing aids are for old people. I'm like, I've been wearing mine since I was three. You're nine to two. Okay. But you can't argue with your grandma. You can't argue. You right. Know? You can't. And it's okay. An expensive lesson, but a wonderful reminder. And it that was a lesson that I got early on in my career. So I always tell my students, I, and we talk about this often in, in my department, is meet them where they're at. Where are they? Are they scared? Okay, acknowledge those feelings that they're scared. And then what could help them overcome that? Tell them what's going to happen, especially young children. I tell them exactly what's going to happen. I give them when it's going to end, like I'll count one, two, three, four, five, and we're going to stop. 
and we're going to count one, two, three, four, five, and it's going to stop. And I don't even have band-aids in this room because nothing's going to hurt. So meeting them where they're at, getting into their shoes, what's happening? What would I like to know if I was scared of lights? Or what would I like to know if I was scared of an otoscope? Maybe somebody had looked in my ear before and it hurt. Yeah. Okay, let's take a look in your dad's ear. Let's take a look in your stuffed animal's ear. Back up and just meet them where they're at because every person deserves to be to feel seen and heard. And totally validated. Absolutely. And that creates that trust Mm -hmm. you were talking about and creates that relationship and that bond that could go on to baby showers and after. (laughs) Lifelong relationship. I love that. Now, what's something that you've decided to tackle that maybe you were afraid to do? Do you ever bring something like an experience you've had into talking with patients? how you said, I've been there and I can tell you exactly what's going to happen and how it's going to feel, but to let them know, like dream big, what was a big dream that you had? So five years ago, I went through a breakup and I decided I need to do something new. I had a crisis of, is audiology what I want to do? I took a very impromptu trip to Africa to visit a friend who was teaching in Uganda. I met her in Zanzibar and Tanzania. And it was scary for me because the signage, especially when you're traveling alone as a woman who's hard of hearing, I was used to traveling with my mom or dad or friends. And most of my friends happened to be hearing. So I never really had to worry about like, where am I going to go? What am I going to hear this? I went alone. There were with barely any English signage where I was. So I was watching people observing, are they speaking English? Are they, where are they? Let's talk about where they're going. Got it. Okay. They're on the same flight as me. I'm going to keep an eye on them, or maybe I'll forge a relationship with them and go together. And then I also went to culinary school. I was like, let's see, is audiology what I want to do? I don't know. What should I do? I've always wanted to go to culinary school. What's stopping me? And honestly, the only thing that was stopping me was my idea that my parents wouldn't approve, that it wouldn't be something worthwhile or potentially not a good career, like financial, finance wise, like everything was like, oh, do you want to be the food next Food Network star? That is yes. very rare. There are so many different culinary careers and what 5% of them end up on TV have a great career because they're famous. I sat down with my dad. I said, Hey, I've always wanted to go to culinary school. What do you think? I don't know where I got the courage with that. Which is like, I just, what do you think? And he goes, go, why don't you just quit your job and go full time? I'm like, no, I want my foot in the door. Hold on. I still like my job. I don't want to just close one door completely and go another way. So I I looked at the schools that were available in San Diego. There was one through an art institute, a culinary institute, and that was a full-time like college. A second one was a part-time one, but the classes were Tuesday morning and Wednesday afternoon and scattered Mm -hmm. around. And I found one that was part-time where I could go, I think it was either Monday, Wednesday or Monday, Wednesday, Friday, or maybe Tuesday, Thursday. It was half of the week, basically. And I walked in, I applied, I interviewed, and I was just so excited. And in my element, when I was talking to the head of the school, he was saying, we're going to teach you how, when, and why different ingredients affect the final product in a meal. We're going to teach you skills that will give you a very good foundation to build upon. And there's an entrepreneur class if you want to. There's baking, pastry, arts, and that side of culinary. There's if you want to go into restaurant business, if you want to go into catering or your own business. And I don't know how, but I just made it happen. I went 50% at my work. I was busy. My externship was most of the time 2 p.m. to maybe 11 p.m. or something like afternoons to evenings, or if you want, 4 a.m. in the morning to 12 or something. I was so busy, but I just loved it. It was probably the hardest hearing situation I've ever been in. Gosh, I couldn't imagine. Yeah. If I was fluent in sign language, it would have been much easier. Maybe, I don't know. 
I don't know. Would you get an ASL interpreter in, in culinary school? I don't know. I suppose you could. You should, by yeah. sure you have the right to, but it would be so hard because, you know, you're running back and forth from the pantry. What is he going to do? Run with you? But it's noisy and their water is running. All of the different hard floors, high ceilings, stainless steel equipment. Ventilation. Um, oh, ventilation. Oh, gosh. Plus refrigerators, all of that. Mixers, food processors, blenders, everything running like food boiling or frying. And my professor had a French accent. He was very heavy French accent. But another one of my lessons is if you want it bad enough, you're going to make it happen, however way it looks. And I feel like most people look for a straight line from here to whatever your goal is. And 90% of the time it's this way, just noodles. Exactly. This is going to happen. This is going to happen. And I'm learning that with entrepreneurship. I'm learning like, huh, okay, but my goal is the same. Because I sat down, I was like, I really want to help parents. I really want to help the children. No, I, I wanted to help the little Michelles who are deaf and hard of hearing. I really want them to know that they can achieve anything possible that they can even just dream of and sit down with that. Hold on to that. If that's the thing that you're committed to, okay, then go about it and be open to that life is going to take you every which way your mind, you're, you're probably your biggest challenge, your mindset, getting oh, yes. in your own way of your goals. Your mind is going to stop you or your ego maybe, or your, I don't know, your, that, that part of your brain that doubts yourself you get to where you want to go. So if I kept these little Michelle's or these children in my mind, how do I help them? Okay. What is their strongest village or support system? First is going to be their parents, then their extended family, then their teachers, their clinicians, all of those people. And though that's who I built my program for. This is my handbook that comes with my online course. There's eight modules. We go over how are you handling the diagnosis or identification? What types of questions or what types of conversations should you have with yourself as a parent, with your co-parent, with your partner? What do you want to commit to? How do you want to see your child's life in the next five years? And okay, let's make a plan. How can we get there? If you're not on the same page with those goals in the beginning, you're always going to have arguments or challenges or difficulties come up because you don't have that end goal in sight. I talk about audiological testing, how to prepare for it, the different types of amplification that are available for them. They don't go into specifics because this is not specifically for your specific child's hearing loss. I talk about school systems. I talk about how to support your child, how to teach them advocacy, but also how to take care of the caretaker. How do you take care of yourself? I saw my mom take care of my grandmother for several years before she passed away. And it takes a toll. It's like watching myself with my kids. And when's the last time I ate my own meal without having to share it with anybody or eating somebody else's leftovers? You know what? I save all the blueberries for you. Cause they're, you eat so many blueberries. They're so expensive, but I want some blueberries. I'm going to eat those blueberries too. Yeah. Sometimes you need to indulge a little bit as that care caregiver. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So I talk about a lot of different things. It's all video modules. And then this handbook is like over 125 pages that goes with it. It helps parents along the journey. There's places to journal different questions, prompts, as well as different forms for them to fill out with everybody who's in their village. It could be a deaf mentor, like a peer mentor. It could be an audiologist. It could be a speech language pathologist or psychiatrist counseling all of those different team players and who I feel is important. I interview my pediatric audiologist. I interview my mom and I learned a lot about her journey, having somebody else filming us because when I just asked her, she, not that she couldn't, but having maybe a fresh set of eyes or a new audience, she opened up about the emotions surrounding her, my, my identification, my diagnosis. And uh, that's probably one of my favorite interviews, but I also interview ENT. I interview a hearing mom of two deaf children, a deaf mom of a hearing and a deaf child. So deaf mom, deaf husband, deaf daughter, hearing son. So he's a CODA and this family chose to implant 
their deaf daughter. And she's the only one in the family who has CI and she really gets the best of both worlds. And I see that how it was possible. I see a lot of times hearing parents get shunned for using cochlear implant for their child. And to that, I say, you know what? It's their family. Those parents are doing the best with what they have in that moment. So who are you to judge or cast opinion on what they're choosing to do? It's very open hearted, open-minded and empowering for parents to do what's best fit for their family. I think that's huge. And you're giving them this set of tools where, you know, you find yourself on this journey with your kids and you don't know where to go as parents that can happen for so many reasons. You could have an autism and ADHD anxiety. It could be some health diagnosis like a hearing loss or some other diagnosis. And you're like, where do I start? What's square one? And I just love that you've mapped it out. As you said, it's gone from for the little ones and through high school. So you know how you can advocate for, I would assume that the older child could read it too and learn how to advocate for themselves in school and different listening environments. But you're just, you're giving them a voice because now they know where to start. You're giving them that authority, really, I think, and that confidence. Yeah. Exactly. Their authority and giving them grace, compassion, yeah. and independence to choose. I don't say go through this program from start to finish, bounce around wherever you're at in the journey, pick and choose where, where you need the help and where do you need support. We're just here for support. We're here for the ride. My job as an audiologist is to provide resources and information for you to make the best decision fit for you, your child best. I, here I am with all of the information. Let me give it to you. Let me present it to you. And, or let's have a conversation. Let's work together. What is your lifestyle like? Okay. you want to go this way? Got it. Maybe you want to take a look at these people or this resource or this website. Okay. Not interested in listening and spoken language. Okay. Let's get you information on deaf community, deaf services, ASL. Where can you learn this? And where, how can you make this decision as a family to go through and have everything accessible for everyone, every member of your family? What, yeah. So good. It's a family approach because it is, it is, it has to, for there to be success. Yeah. Um, but you're not a family with a deaf and hard of hearing child. You become a deaf and hard of hearing family, honestly, because it affects how you converse in the kitchen while you're washing dishes. It affects your experience at the movie theater. It affects your experience at sporting events, or if your children want to participate in sports, it affects you as a parent, because you're going to have to learn how to advocate for yourself as a parent who, of a special needs child, advocate for your child who may have special needs, and then teach your child how to advocate for themselves, as well as their siblings. I, it's so funny. I was nervous when I became a mom. How am I going to tell my daughter that I have hearing loss? How do I tell her that I need my cochlear implant processes to hear her? And once I told her and started getting more comfortable talking about it with this little person who thinks the world of me, I was just afraid of that moment when your children realize, oh, my mom and dad aren't superheroes. I was afraid of that and I wanted to postpone it for as long as possible. But once I just broke it, she still thinks the world of me and she shares with her younger sister as well as her friends who asked me, Michelle, what is that? What is that on your ear? What is it? And she comes running up. She's, it's my mom's cochlear implant. Want to see me put it on? I know how to put it on. I'm like, this is so fun. I have somebody on my team who knows how to put it on for me, knows how to change batteries for me if needed. And I feel taken care of in that way by my four-year-old. That's the beauty of these kids. Like they, they just love their parents. And I, I think it's so cool that she embraces it just as much as you do. And I know you said you were afraid that she's not going to think you're like a superhero, but now she probably thinks you are even more because in talking to you about your story, she's probably heard how it wasn't always easy. I had to work hard, like culinary school. Come on. That's tough for those hearing at a normal level. Yeah, and but she goes to friends' houses and wait, your mom doesn't know how to cook ramen noodles or something. I don't know. Every parent is different. Exactly. But you've faced these challenges head on. And so she's 
inspired. I think that's, yes, you are a superhero. <laughs> I I just love seeing her. I never know where my home otoscope is because she has it somewhere. <laughs> she's looking at things. And then just out and about, she's, she's look, mama, that shell looks like a cochlea. I'm like, did you just say cochlea? I love that you can. Oh my gosh. <laughs> And then we're also learning sign language as a family. She loves being able to tell me something while her mouth is full, especially. It's funny. So I love the journey that we're on. And I think I learned a lot just through opening up and being vulnerable on social media. And I know it's helped others, but I mean, what's most significant to me is it's helped me with my own journey, with my own transformation. Now, I have to tell you, Michelle, I through me liking Instagram accounts and everything, I started following you a long time ago. (laughs) And so when we were contacted about the podcast and this connection was made, I like exclaimed, I'm so excited about this because (laughs) I have been following her and I just, I love the open honesty and vulnerability. We always talk about how like fake Facebook life is, social media life can be, and you only see the perfect. But when we're embracing the imperfect, we're embracing the uniqueness. I don't even want to say imperfect, the unique qualities about ourselves and other people. It's just, that's the really Mm -hmm. good juicy parts of life. I call those little parts extraordinary. They're just extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. Just abnormal, whatever. And uh, I was taught in one of my, I took a leadership course. And if something's, if the, if the sky is falling, it's an opportunity for something. And instead of swearing or saying, oh no, or playing victim, just say yes. Okay. Accept it. Yes. What opportunities are coming up? How can I MacGyver this situation? How can I hack this situation? And the best stories that come out from it. Creativity comes from scarcity. Who knew Caesar salad came from Mexico or Tijuana, I think. When Really? You, oh yeah. When oh. I think a couple or some people were caught in a bad weather and in the kitchen pantry, that's all they had. Like anchovies and it eggs. Would be, but think about it. Like creamy, buttery, fatty eggs and then salty anchovies. Caesar salad is delicious. Yes. Get a made table side. People are like, wait, what is in this? And chocolate chip cookies were a mistake. Oh, they were? I didn't know they that. They were. It was supposed to be a chocolate cookie. Okay. And the woman had her chocolate chopped up because it's a big bar and you chop it up to melt it over a bain marie. Mm-hmm. And then you add that to your dough. And so she had it all chopped up very finely to melt it and then knock the bowl into the dough. Oh, perfect. Oh, chocolate chip cookie. And she Hold said, on. bake it and see if it turns to a chocolate cookie. And it was a chocolate chip cookie. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Too bad she can't get credit for every single one. I know. I know. That's what I learned in culinary school. <laughs> yes. I, I love all of those little, the, they're happy accidents. Hello, mm-hmm. Bob Ross. Yep. Yes. I love him. I remember him. Yeah. <laughs> My kids love him. So Michelle, is there like a piece of advice that you would give to somebody along this journey or, or a hearing loss journey as a parent and, or a patient, even as a, somebody who maybe had a pediatric case like yourself and they're venturing out into the world. I tell parents or their support village, take a breath, just process where you're at, process where your child is and be in the moment because there's always silver linings. There's always something that you can pick on or complain about. But the cool thing is that it's only yours. I went through my journey the way I did. My mom went through the same journey the way she did and they were quite opposite. I was this happy-go-lucky kid who didn't know better, who had everything in the world that she needed. I was fed. I had toys. I was happy. I had family. And when she got the, when she heard my diagnosis, she thought it was the end of the world. She thought it was her fault. What did she do in pregnancy or delivery? And, or she thought, oh, it's because I went back to work. I was supposed to be a stay-at-home mom. The emotions that I didn't, I understand them now as a mother, 
And I saw her crying when I was maybe four or five. I said, mama, what's wrong? And she said, I wish I could take your hearing loss for you. I don't know how, I don't remember this. She said that I was just a toddler. And I said, maybe this is the way God meant for me to be. <laughs> and she's like, but at that moment, they stopped taking me to doctors. I, was, I went to acupuncturists. I went to herbalists. I tried Chinese medicine. They took me, so we were from Ohio. I went to Ohio. They took me to New York. They took me to Chicago to see what's the cause of her hearing loss. And back then they didn't know that much about genetics. With the cochlear high drops, is there something going on in the ear? They begged for exploratory surgery. But in that moment when they realized I'm still the same Michelle before and after, I'm still bubbly. I'm still going to talk your ear off. It gave them maybe like a piece of stillness, just being, she's going to be okay. And my dad, he didn't express that much growing up. But when I interviewed him, he was saying like, your attitude is what helped us get through it. My mom said she doesn't even know what brand hearing aids I wore, what co- cochlear implant brand I had, because I was like, these are my hearing aids. I'm going to take, I want to change the batteries. I want to learn how to put them in. Three or four years out old. I don't, oh don't have any three or four year olds that I would trust <laughs> with devices. And she said, I just, took complete ownership of them. I was so happy to have them. I understood what they gave me. And I also understood I got something when I chose to turn them off. My little piece of the world that's just mine. And to this day, if I am overwhelmed, my devices come off. I just need some alone time and it's great. (laughs) Take that deep breath and of recenter and reanalyze. And like you said, silver lining has different ways of how to perceive it. So take a breath, process where you are, honor yourself and be open to seeing and honoring where your child is or your partner is or your where your clinician may be. Where are they coming from? And honor that. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I love it. Oh my gosh. I think that just everything, it, this is what this podcast is about. It's finding those unique takes on things, different perspectives. And that's really what we've had with everybody that's been on so far. And it's because everybody's experience is unique. Nobody's journey, like you said, even just your journey, but it's yours and your mom's and your dad's and, and your providers, how they've interpreted your journey and helped you along it. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. I'll talk to you soon, Lindsay. Thank you. Thank you for joining us on this episode of the Hearing Wellness Journey podcast. For more information about what we do and the services we provide, please visit our website at hearingwellnessjourney.com slash podcast, where you can find more resources based on today's discussion, as well as request to be a member of our Hearing Wellness Journey community on Facebook. That's available for our listeners exclusively on hearingwellnessjourney.com forward slash podcast.